When errors occur in practice, studies repeatedly confirm that telling the patient and family about the mistake results in far less severe ramifications for the healthcare professional and our facility. We're going to continue with part three and complete the lessons of legal issues in nursing and healthcare. With more states recognizing nursing malpractice as a legitimate claim in a civil suit, the question of whether nurses should carry malpractice insurance has become increasingly important. And the reasons why are, it is assumed that all nurses purchase malpractice insurance, which is a general recommendation as a result of changes in the healthcare system. More states recognize nurse malpractice as a legitimate claim in a civil suit. Functions for RNs and advanced practice nurses are expanding. Increasing floating and cross-training mandates. Nurses have increasing responsibility for supervising subordinate staff. Some employers may fail to initiate an adequate defense for nurses. And because most insurance coverage limits that are lower than the actual judgment, that are made against the nurse in a lawsuit. Closely tied to the concepts of negligence and malpractice is that of liability. It asserts that every person is responsible for the wrong or injury done to another as the result of carelessness. Personal liability. It requires nurse to assume responsibility for patient harm or injury that is a result of negligent acts. Nurse cannot be relieved of liability by another professional, such as a physician or nurse manager, and damages can be levied against current assets and future earnings. Personal liability with floating and cross-training. Nurses should be cognizant of state statutes and case laws services outside their usual practice area. In no case is a nurse permitted to render services if the requisite knowledge to act competently is lacking. Nurses have a legal duty to refuse specific tasks that they cannot perform safely and competently, but should consider negotiation and compromise with the supervisor. Personal liability for team leaders and managers. They're held to the standard of care of a reasonably prudent supervisor. Team leaders and managers have been held negligent for issues surrounding triage of staff and equipment, supervision of subordinates, delegation of patient care tasks, reporting of team member performance deficits, and supporting or invoking the chain of command process when indicated. In these circumstances, it is not always correct to argue with your supervisor and say, I'm not going to do it, I'm not competent because you should have the knowledge and the skills to perform a skill or a treatment or an intervention. The ideal situation would be for you to say that I have the knowledge to do this skill, but I have not actually demonstrated this skill. Think about it. If you use the words that you are incompetent to perform this skill, the supervisor may let you go, stating that you are incompetent to meet job requirements. By telling the supervisor that you have the knowledge, but you have not demonstrated the skill, provides an opportunity for the supervisor to either get you some help to demonstrate the skill or to provide education so that you can feel competent in the skill. Nurse managers and administrators are held liable for inadequate training. Failure to periodically reevaluate staff competencies. Failure to discipline or terminate unsafe workers. Negligent in developing appropriate policies and procedures. And failure to uphold institutional licensing laws and state and federal statutes. RNs functioning in the role of team leader or in any supervisory capacity should review the following. The detailed job description including responsibilities when asked to supervise in an unfamiliar area or floor, job descriptions for team members, formal period of training and mentoring in the role, validated proof of competencies, guidelines for personal patient care assignments, chain of command, 
And then the nurse managers and administrators should be aware of case law regarding incompetent charge nurses and team leaders. Personal liability in delegation and supervision of team members. Nurses must be absolutely clear about the lawfulness of patient care assignments. Determine whether it is reasonable and prudent to delegate a task on the basis of knowledge of the worker, patient status, and current work setting conditions. I want to bring to your attention employer liability, also known as vicarious liability. The defenses against claims of vicarious liability are they borrowed the servant uh, doctrine, basically captain of the ship theory. The employer also may be liable for negligent conduct of nurses within the scope of their employment and it's based on the legal principle of respondent superior. So other words like let the master answer. They have to make sure they have adequate numbers of qualified nursing staff. Now we're going to review corporate liability. Healthcare corporations can be held to a specified standard of care. Healthcare facilities have been found corporately liable for failing to have adequate numbers of qualified nursing staff. The Joint Commission has developed standards related to orientation, training, and education of agency staff. So how can we reduce legal liability? Well, we have risk management systems. These track incidents and accidents in the facility. They assist in the development of policies and procedures to improve practice. They provide knowledge about federal and state laws, licensing laws, and healthcare case laws. Let's talk about a few examples such as incident reports or unusual occurrence reports. Nurses are legally bound to report critical incidents to the manager. Critical incidents that result in patient injury or death may lead to a malpractice claim. No appropriate procedures for completing and filing the incident report. Describe events objectively. Avoid subjective comments or personal opinions. Never note in the medical record that an incident report was completed or filed. Never photocopy the incident report. Physician's order for an incident report should not be written in the chart and report every unusual occurrence or incident. Now I want to talk about intentional torts in nursing practice. For definition, we have to have a direct violation of a person's legal rights. The plaintiff does not have to prove that the nurses breached a special duty or was negligent. Consequences include fines and punitive damages but may rise to the level of criminal acts. Assault and battery. Assault is causing a person to fear that he or she will be touched without consent. Battery is the unauthorized touching or the actual harmful or offensive touching of a person and may rise to the level of a crime. The nurse should ask patient's permission before initiating any procedure and document permission granted. Defamation of character. Libel is defamation caused by written word. Nurses subject to libel for subjective comments written in the medical record. Slander is defamation caused by spoken word. Nurses subject to slander when they repeat subjective comments about patients in public places. False imprisonment. This is the unlawful restraint or detention of another person against his or her wishes. The nurse has no authority to detain a patient even if there is a likelihood of harm or injury. Invasion of privacy. Persons' private affairs, including health history and status, are made public without consent. The nurse has a legal and ethical duty to maintain patient confidentiality. Intentional infliction of emotional distress. This is the nurse's behavior is so outrageous that it leads to the patient's emotional shock. Crime is an offense against society that is defined through written criminal statutes or codes, punishable by fines, imprisonment, or the death penalty in some states. An increasing number of nurses are being charged with criminal acts. Misdemeanor offenses. 
These are minor criminal offenses. The common offenses nurses are charged with are illegal practice of medicine, failing to report child abuse, falsification of medical records, or assault and battery and physical abuse of patients. Felony acts are major criminal offenses. Common offenses can be drug trafficking, fraud in billing services for Medicare patients, theft, rape, or murder. Now let's talk about the law and patient rights. We have advanced directive. These are statutes that grants adults the right to refuse extraordinary medical treatment when no hope of recovery. Patients' wishes are made known through execution of a formal document known as the living will. The medical and physician directives. This is a document that lists desire of patient in a particular scenario. If property executed provides a physician with immunity from claims of negligence in the patient's death. Do not resuscitate orders. They're written by the physician on the basis of directives by the patient. Nurses have absolute duty to respect patients' DNR orders. A lawfully executed DNR order must be followed. Durable power of attorney for health care. It's a document that authorizes patient to name the person who will make the day-to-day -day and end-of-life decisions when he or she becomes decisionally incompetent. Informed consent. Physician or advanced practice nurse has the duty to disclose information so the patient can make intelligent choices. It's mandated by federal statute and state law. Information that must be disclosed is nature of the therapy or procedure, expected benefits and outcomes, potential risk, alternative therapies, risk of not having the procedure. The provider cannot delegate this duty to the RN. If the nurse has reason to believe that the patient has not given informed consent, the provider should be immediately notified. In no case should the nurse attempt to convey information required for informed consent. The right to refuse treatment. An adult of sound mind has a right to refuse any treatment that has previously been agreed to. The nurse must notify the provider if the patient refuses treatment. The provider should give patient information about the consequences, risk, and benefits of refusing treatment and explore available alternatives. Leaving against medical advice. Most people have heard this or referred to this as AMA. The nurse must act promptly to notify the provider. The nurse must clearly articulate the danger inherent in leaving. The value of AMA document will depend a great deal on the nurse's charting, which should note that leaving the facility could result in the following, aggravated current condition and complicated future care, permanent physical or mental impairment or disability, and complications that could lead to death. Nurses have been charged with offenses including assault, battery, and false imprisonment when they unlawfully detain patients. One such unlawful detainment is the use of physical restraints. This is any restraint that's chemical or physical. It is imprisonment. You want to use the least restrictive restraint and only when all other strategies have been exhausted. Physical and chemical restraint use and seclusion governed by federal and state statutes and accrediting bodies can get you into trouble. Charges of assault and battery and false imprisonment can be leveled against nurses who use restraints improperly. Nurses may lawfully apply restraints in an emergency when, in their judgment, no other strategies are effective in protecting the patient from harm. Careful nursing documentation is essential when restraints are applied, and you must have a physician's order for any type of restraints. Nurses need to understand the legalities involved in the delivery of safe health care. It is important to know the standards of care established within your institution and the rules and regulations in the Nurse Practice Acts of your state, province, or territory, because these are the standards to which you will be held accountable. This concludes the lessons on legal issues in nursing and health care. If you have any questions related to course content, contact the instructor.